Hello and welcome to SME TV. This is our Let's Talk Views segment and I'm your host, Angela Vithulkas. Please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can support us and all SMEs. And you know what? We want you to comment. Please jump in right now and comment below. Tell us what you think, but most importantly, share SME TV. Now, joining me today to discuss the realities of the hospitality industry is Ivan Brewer, restaurant profitability expert. Welcome, Ivan. Hello, Angela. Nice to be here. Thank you very much for joining us. This is a very exciting day for me. I love talking hospitality. And Craig Joel, MD of the disruptive online reservations platform, Now Book It. Hi, Joel. Yeah, how are you going, Angela? Nice to be here. Thank you so much. And, and Joel, we've just, oh, sorry, Craig, we've just looked at some data saying that you might be inching in front as one of the Australia's leading online reservations platforms. Yeah, that's correct. We're probably, without question, we're the fastest growing, but we're definitely uh, one of the largest across Australia and New Zealand at present. So I, I kind of had an image in my head of, of the old, I'm showing my age, Pac-Man eating up everything in front of it and, and how it's great to hear of uh, a, a bunch of guys from hospitality that got together to improve the tech in hospitality and not take advantage of hospitality. But yeah, that's, that's, just, that's just my view. That's just my view, Craig. All right, guys, we're going to jump straight into this. I'm going to ask a general question. Uh, I want you to think about this carefully, but I'm going to go to you first, Ivan. Is there a problem with hospitality profitability? Uh, is it just something that we've made up to get attention? Or, Ivan, tell me, are we less profitable now? Were we always like this? Has the world completely shifted on its axis and there's no money to be made in hospitality anymore? Over the last decade, we have been in a crisis of profitability within hospitality uh, for a number of reasons. One being that we've grown exponentially. So in a decade, we've gone from 14 to 42,000 businesses, but the total market's only increased by 5%. So 14? 14. To 42,000? To 42,000 businesses. And what, how do you classify those businesses? So cafes, restaurants, bars, so okay. standard sort of ABS statistics. Right. Yeah. Okay, then that's in a decade. Well, and the market hasn't grown. Only by 5%. So if, if we would look at it from a mean perspective, yep. restaurants have lost $300,000 in revenue per business as an overall by the sheer amount of competition. If, if, um, if my brother was here, Craig, he would be jumping up and down saying, I told you, I told <laughs> you, I've been telling you this for years because as you know, my family was all about hospitality for so many years. Craig, how do you feel about that? Yeah, listen, I think Ivan's hit the nail on the head. I mean, we have been stuck in this sort of time warp and, and haven't really made a lot, hell of a lot of changes. I think there's, you know, a number of factors for that. I think, um, you know, I've always been a believer that anyone can just come in and open up a restaurant and, and I don't know that that's the right way and I don't know that we can change that or be in a position to change that. But I've always believed that a restaurant to usually needs to have three acumen um, or a very good understanding of at least two of the three and, and there's obviously marketing um, having some kind of business sense yep. uh, or accounting sense so they can uh, manage exactly what either what Ivan's talking about which is the profitability yep. and then um, you've got just hospitality experience just basic hospitality experience so I think you need to have an understanding of the basics of the industry before you jump into that business. So I, are you telling me, Craig, that it's not enough to just wake up one day and go, I'd love to own a restaurant? No, but unfortunately that's pretty common. Or a cafe, and, and that unfortunately is quite common. And you'll often find that those businesses are the ones that, that often go out of, out of, uh, out of service. Ivan, I, I used to spend um, a lot of times talking to customers within our businesses who would come up to us and say, oh, I love the idea of owning a cafe. I'm getting a big payout for my redundancy or my retrenchment or my retirement fund. And I'm just going to open up a little cafe somewhere because, you know, I love to make coffee. I want to talk to all the customers. And I would get this glazed look come across my face and I'd just go put my hand up and go, don't do it. And I'd walk away. And I agree. I think that for a long time, it's just been very misunderstood and very underestimated just how complicated 
hospitality is. So it is, in fact, the most complicated industry to work in. It's the one that's most susceptible to economic fluctuations. When you think about variable, de variable demand, so we don't know how much revenue we're getting from day to day, that changes within a week, let alone seasonally. And then we're managing that variable demand with variable expenses relating to our cost of goods and our purchasing, trying to match that with, uh, with staffing costs. It's incredibly complicated, so and which has not been reflected by an easy entry, as Craig had mentioned. So it's easy to get into the business, and that's been one of the challenges as well, ironically, because because it's so easy to open a business, people can't get out, right? So forty percent of businesses are making no money. Yep. That happened before the pandemic, right? I, and I absolutely agree with that figure. It's not hard to to see that the reality of that, and then they can't sell. So they can't close down because they lose their house because they need the equity up against it for the for the debt. They can't sell because someone else can just come on in. So we have all of these like almost walking dead businesses within the industry that are predating on the total market. So it's just not enough for everybody to go around. Yeah. And and the thing that frustrates me is that we just don't we we aren't opening our eyes and opening our mind. We're still doing things the way that we always have even though there is no evidence that doing it that way is the right way or it's the profitable way. It's, it's almost a tradition kind of thing. Craig, um, I want to talk to you about your past lives. So yeah. you, were, you were president of the Catering Institute for 12 years. You've worked yeah. with thousands of venues right across Australia and New Zealand, you know, 30 years in hospitality. I mean this in a nice way. You're, you're a relic in the industry, right? <laughs> I am, yeah. Just, just by oh, yeah. definition. I mean, we could, we could find yeah. evidence of you in, in, in other worlds, in other countries, if we, if we excavate enough. It and, just made and, me feel a lot older. <laughs> I, I'm all about making you feel good. Um, now you're a tech disruptor. Yeah. So if we explore that, if we combine the years and the decades of experience across the board, both from managing an association, which is a very different world, to yeah. also being hands-on in the hospitality industry, and now you're a tech disruptor, Tell us what kind of people in the market that you play in now as a tech disruptor. What about those companies? I mean, I've, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote you. You use the word parasitical companies. So tell, mm -hmm. tell us about them and their effect that they're having on the hospitality industry. Yeah, I mean, the large majority of those, as I, that I mentioned when we first chatted, were they're, they're web-based companies or technology companies. And they've come into the market to try to get between the, the business and the business owner and the and the customers. And so you've got this intermediary that sits there um, taking either the customer data or a clip of the uh, the revenue that's coming through the restaurant. Clip the and, ticket, yep. Yeah. And, the problem and, a, with and that, a hefty clip, Craig. Yeah, no, it, well, depending on the type of business, you know, it varies depending on the business. But virtually every one of the companies that has come out in the tech space in the hospitality sector is trying to take a clip of some kind. Yep. And it seems to be the norm. And, and I think that's, you know, as Ivan's alluded to, it's just not sustainable. Um, the companies to take 30%, for, for instance, from a delivery company, is simply not sustainable, even at 10%, when you're having pickup, deliver, you know, people coming to your own restaurant and you still have to pay 10%. It's, not, it's just not feasible to be able to continue that, that kind of business practice. So, and I don't think there's any other industry on the planet who would be accepting of a... Uh, a business coming in between their customers and their business and and not be charging for that. Whereas at the moment, the reason I feel it's broken is because restaurants are being charged for that intermediary to come between their customers and their business. And it just makes no sense at all. Let's, let's inform people a little bit more directly. There are other platforms, reservations platforms, which are charging yeah. by the head, right? Correct, yeah. And, and that's where that's a huge cannibalism, if you will, of, of the owner's profits because we yeah. don't have as big a margin markup in hospitality as people perceive. And Ivan, I'm going to get to you and coffee, but it's just a ridiculous situation where if, if you said to any numbers man, take away the industry, if you said you were going to have to pay someone 30% of what you're charging in order to deliver something, you'd be laughed out of a financial room. Yeah. You would. And I think that the hard thing that I, the thing that I struggle with the most is that you've got these businesses that have got huge databases of their own, like a restaurant that might have 10,000 customers on their database and, and a lot of regular customers. And then you've got a big company, like one of these large companies, these delivery companies or booking companies. Or booking companies, yep. 
Yeah, they're coming to market and they've got no data at all. So the way they create that data is they farm it from the very customers that these restaurants have spent decades, yeah. uh, you know, collating. And yeah. now that's becoming theirs. And they're doing that, you know, just multiplies. All of a sudden their database has gone from one restaurant of 10,000 customers to 2,000 restaurants with, you know, 250,000, a quarter of a million, 2 million, 4 million, depending on the size that's of the right. company. And then they're using that data against the very businesses that help them build it. it that's right. It, it infuriates me. Because you know what to look for. But Ivan, most people in the hospitality industry, and, you know, I've been there myself, it's not that we aren't educated or that we're stupid. It's just that we aren't aware of, of these other worlds, if you will, when these other, other players come into the market. And we're thinking that it's a good decision, but we're making some really bad decisions that are eating into our profitability. And, and coffee is one, and we're going to get to that because that's a subject very close to my heart. But we're focusing on profitability. We know that if you are going to be a successful business, you have to make money. To make money, you must make profit. And when we look at how much we invest in hospitality businesses, Ivan, the general public don't understand that and don't know it, but we should know as owners. Talk, tell us a bit about that, how much we invest versus how much we're making. If I could just um, add to Craig's comment just briefly, I think that part of the success of of these other companies, because we're not, we're not stupid in hospitality. No. But the very superficial level of their statements look quite promising, right? They say, yep. well, if you have extra capacity, then I can bring you more customers. I can supply you customers that you aren't already getting. And that sounds okay. So I've, I've got 10,000, you bring me an extra couple of thousand, great. But what actually happens in reality is that they try to steal your existing customers yep. and sell them back to you. And also you have to pay for that new customer every single time they come back. Yep. You know, so they're going to actually actively try to get in between your existing client base. So yep. that, that's the issue. And within hospitality, we have a set capacity, okay? So generally I found in my experience that about 12 hours amounts to about 50% of your revenue. So the peak 12 hours over, over the week. Now, you can only make so much food or product right. within that time, right? So if I make 100 meals within that peak time, that's great. But all of a sudden now I've got delivery and 30% of those meals now have a 30% commission. That's I'm right. not adding additional meals on top of my capacity because I can't make any more. No. And so you're I've squeezing... now just made less money. Yeah. You're squeezing your result. margins and that, that's static, that 30% commission that they're taking that's a static cost there because that's what they're always going to take but that might be the week when avocados are a hundred dollars a box as opposed to 10 or 12 that tomatoes are 80 or 90 dollars a box as opposed to 10 or 12 not to mention every other cost well I won't even touch electricity you've just had your rent whacked up for the year four percent which is standard increase if nothing else everything else has gone up every other overhead has jumped every year upon year and then suddenly you're dealing with a 30% squeeze. We don't make 30%. Exactly right. Yeah. We don't make, and we've got the risk, right? We're employing people. We're paying all the insurances. We're paying the rent. We've got the mortgage. We've got the loans. We've got the overdrafts. You know, we won't talk about merchant fees and where that's being split and clipped at the ticket everywhere, but we're being squeezed in such a hefty way in another, from another supplier who we're paying for the privilege of us making less money. I, yeah. I have used to have these conversations and I would walk away confused as to how that was ever a good deal. I think but, within hospitality, we so often operate from a place of overwhelm yeah. because there's a thousand things happening at once. We're working 80 and a hundred hours. It's, yep. We've not just been doing it for the last week. We've been doing this for weeks, months, years at a years. time. Yep. And we make very snap decisions. So we just look at something, mm -hmm. make a decision and move on without truly understanding what the implications are. And, and to support what Craig had been saying, like for, for me, I see everything to do with the business. So I see their zero accounts. I see everything. I see the, the complete disclosure. And what I've noticed as a trend is that the, the food tech spends have gone from several hundred dollars a year yep. up to several thousand dollars of a year, a That's year right. over the last five years, but with no improvement in profitability. So mm -hmm. no one's making more money as a result of that investment. So we're not choosing the right things that either make us money say, or save us money. Yep. And to prove to everyone that we do actually record live, 
Ivan, you need to come a little bit closer because you've got a nice piece of sun stripping there. Or, or how we are we going to close the curtains? You fix for a second, that. You, you like. go ahead. Yeah, sorry. And fix that. I'll, I'll, I'll keep talking to Craig. We're happy here. So, um, Craig, I want to talk about training in the industry because we're not yeah. going to improve where we go unless we have better training options. And Ivan, we're talking about training now. I just want to touch on that lightly because the future of our industry depends on our people being better trained. Now, we've got people going to TAFE and doing four-year apprenticeships and coming out supposedly as chefs mm. and they don't learn much about the business of food. Yeah, they can't even cost a menu. No. Exactly. It's so a huge issue. How, how can we have our industry improving and moving forward and understanding that profit is a key component like any other major ingredient? You know, you wouldn't just take oil out of a recipe. You wouldn't just take seasoning out of a recipe. And yet we're taking the business of food out of training the very people who are often in control of the food costs. Completely yeah. agree. And I think if you look at the panel of people that actually advise what these TAFE courses need to be and what the curriculums need to be, they're all representative of very large businesses. Yeah. We don't have representatives of SMEs. No. So there, there is under no circumstance could they be that could they claim that these business these um, the staff that are being produced by these organisations are suitable to improving an SME to a small business. They all need to they would all do well within a large business where where business per se is not something that they'd need to deal with. Yeah. So uh, I can add to that just firsthand. Please that do. Experience. I have been you know, a previous restaurant owner um, and not having the business acumen. I had worked in Hospo for a long period prior to owning a restaurant um, and had done a little bit of marketing. So I understood of how I could promote my business and get people in the door. But one of the things I didn't do was understand every week that I needed to know. It wasn't even every week. I needed to probably understand every day uh, exactly what my business was doing and how profitable it was on a daily basis because in fact what was happening by the end of the week i thought i had a great week huge revenue but in fact i'd gone backwards by 5k and it was a combination of of staff costs but probably more more importantly more on topic it was my food it was there was items on my menu that just weren't as profitable as they should have been yep. um the menus hadn't been costed out properly uh, i had a junior chef in the restaurant at the time and put a lot of responsibility on them Yep. Because I hadn't come from a chef background myself. So um, the costing component was something that I, I understood, but not as innately as someone that you would think had been to college for four to five years, worked in other restaurants for five or six years. You would think they'd have that, that innate understanding of the costing. But as I've alluded to and you've alluded to, they, they, a large majority don't. It's not to say that all of them don't, but um, a large majority don't understand the business components behind running a venue. Well, we, we know that their training lacks that as far as the official TAFE courses go. Then you wonder when they do start working in a venue why that training hasn't improved along the way. I mean, if you don't make... In, in the corporate world, you've got to take your team on the journey. You need to be able to communicate with your team. This expensive, don't waste it. Mm. This, you do have to often point out the obvious because whilst they might be getting on the phone and doing the orders ringing the fruit and veg man, ringing the small goods supplier, ringing the butcher, they might sign for an invoice, but they're not looking at the cost per kilo or something and thinking, you know, should I change that cut of meat to something cheaper so that we can make more money and it will get us the same result? This is, this is where the training falls down. However, let's say that you do train people up. And, and I know that when we were in the cafe world, I would often have my uh, glad wrap kicks. I'd go into the kitchen, I'd watch the chef wrap a bucket with, you know, what I would say was a kilometre of glad wrap round and round and round and round. And I would say, you know, we're not sending this into outer space. Get a lid. You know, do we need to use 25 metres of glad wrap to contain food in a bucket that's not alive and it won't jump out? And, and those are basic food costs because I knew that everything that came from the supplier of packaging was essentially stuff that went in the bin. I, I knew that. That invoice, mm. it's going in the rubbish. Yes. So it's those kind of things, Ivan, that make the difference between being profitable. You do have to watch every single thing. So let's assume that we were kind of doing that before COVID. COVID's hit. We've gone into hibernation or we're in coma or we're on hold or whatever. Now we're coming out of it. 
What's going to change for these businesses now, Ivan? The main thing that I try to push and my, my consistent narrative is that we really need to think in a new way. We really need, and I think there's been some positives through that because we've had to, the, this hasn't been this nice linear um, rolling out of restrictions via the pandemic. It's been yeah. all over the place. Mm. So through the messaging and through all of, you know, state by state sort of measures. So it's been very difficult for operators to actually understand and roll those out. So they've had to be very fleet of foot. Um, they've had to be able to look at alternatives very, very quickly. So I think that's been a real positive to look at all of a sudden turning into delivery only where they've been predominantly uh, looking at internal and in dine in. So those things I think are really positive. Yeah. And for me, and now there, there is this added complexity, of course, because we have a significant um, subsidies of wages and there can be rent relief periods. A lot of the time they're simply going to be paid back. Yep. at a later date, which is going to perhaps put a little bit more risk on the business than yes. there was before. Um, and, and referring to what Craig had mentioned, when you, a mis one mistake can lose you three, four, five thousand $5,000 in a week. Yes. So that could be a month's worth of revenue to pay that back. Mm. It, it takes a very long time to pay that back. Yeah. So simple short-term decisions really hurt. So, we're, so I think the big thing for me is that we just need to really assess what we're doing. Yep. A lot of the tech has been wiped out. So a lot of people, of course, the first thing they did is stop paying all of their, their tech, which is probably something that Craig had experienced. Uh, people wound back where they could. And yes. to really understand that there is two types of, of technology. They're either going to support you to be yep. successful and profitable or they're not. Mm. And to really dig beyond the sales pitch and what it is that you're being promised, don't just do what everybody's saying or what you're seeing in the media or what you're seeing as industry associations are pushing. Yep. What's going to make the most amount of sense for you? Because no two businesses are the same. So, and, and that's, and that's been one of the big issues that we have within the industry. That's, that's the thing in hospitality, right? No one to be, you know, you, you could have this great cafe that also has a takeaway component. There's less profitability in a takeaway as in a dine-in menu if it's, if it's treated differently as well. We yeah. didn't touch on coffee. But one of the things we were going to talk about is the way that the coffee industry or the baristas, if you will, are treated being, you know, perhaps even elevated to a, above a qualified chef and how long it takes to make coffee. And, and Ivan, I'm, I'm going to quote you, but I'm going to get Craig to jump in on the answer before you do, Ivan. You know, we need to understand what we are. We are either efficiency-based or experience-based businesses. Choose one. You can't be both. So... Craig, you either want the experience of going to fine dining and you're going to pay, you know, $30 for an entree and $50 for a main yeah. and have the flourish and the, the customer experience at all and, and walk out $200 poorer, or you're going to go to a cafe and get, you know, a large cappuccino and a schnitzel sandwich and probably enjoy it just as much. Yeah. But there's a difference, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah if you're hungry, really you're going to enjoy it just as much. Yeah, I mean, for me, I've always been a believer that if the, um, you know, if the value proposition is compelling enough, the consumer is going to be happy and they're going to see perceive value. So it doesn't matter if you're going to a fine dining restaurant and paying two hundred bucks. Yep. As long as the experience is being compelling enough to you for you to see value in it, then it's all good. So I've I've spent stupid amounts of money at dinner sometimes and not enjoyed myself. Um, I've done the same at low end restaurants as well, mind you. But I have also had experiences where you know, I might have had six or seven courses um, and the entire experience, the theatre of the, of the that's, venue. That's right. The hustle and bustle. So as long as you're getting that value, I, I see that it's, um, that is, the value is compelling, then you get value. And I It'll think work. restaurants it's... don't always look for value. No. Um, coming to the coffee thing, I'm not yep. 100% sure on the direction there. I mean, I, I, from what I'm thinking you're trying to get across is that if you, the experience is more of, um, the coffee art or the way that people spend the time making your latte look mag yep. magical. So when you get it, you're like, oh, my God. And I think, you know, it's it's cool to see that in some particular venues and I think it has a place. Um, but I think, as Ivan's probably alluded to, when it comes down to profitability, which is why you're in business for, you want to bust out as many bloody coffees as you can get, get within Efficiency. the hour. Efficiency. And it's, it's exactly you, right. You, it's the efficiency of it, Ivan. That's the turnover. I mean, I remember... And yes, I am showing my age. There was, there was a time many, many, many decades ago that coffee lounges, not cafes, because they were coffee lounges, had an espresso machine for show. <laughs> we didn't actually use them. We used international roast instant coffee. And you boiled the hell out of the milk so that the froth would be a physical structure. 
<laughs> you know, above the coffee. But it, but it was all that. about profit. Yeah. Because that's how you make money. What I think is the, the irony of where we are now within cafes is, is that often we'll, we'll hear the narrative or the, the conversation that we need, you know, customers need to pay more. You know, we're not charging enough. As if yep. there's, you know, some miraculously people are going to start paying more in a very competitive industry. But what we've done is we've put ourselves in this situation. So we, we've now, it costs us more money to buy the beans because they're, no, they're much more expensive, single origin, et cetera, et cetera. That's right. We've got multiple grinders. We're paying the barista more money to That's take right. less time yep. to make coffee, but we can't charge anymore. So we are literally making less money as a result. And as an industry, our answer to that seems to be that we, want, we need to charge more. And I think yep. what sort of, again, what sort of Craig touched upon, when we talk about sort of lower end, high end restaurants, it's important to understand that these are business models, right? Yes. So people have a strategy through which they make money. So no one or the other is better. Mm. There's nothing wrong with wherever you sit within that range. It all comes down to how do you go about being profitable? All right. And I think Last... that's where we tend to get caught up in the high end and the expensive side of things. Yeah. Yes, why, why we spend stupid money setting up a business, forgetting that no one's going to care if that plate cost $500 to buy or the chair was $650 as a unit when you could get on Gumtree and get 50 chairs for that price secondhand. And guess what? Bums on seats still feels the same on a $10 chair as it does on a on a $700 chair. Sometimes they're more comfortable, the cheaper ones. We've, we've all sat on those uncomfortable looking ones. <laughs> uh, we need to wrap up because as usual, I have always gone over time. So last thoughts, um, and I'll, I'll come back to you last, Ivan, but I'll, I'll put you on the spot, Craig. If we are talking about profitability and the industry needs to be profitable if it's going to survive, can you give us a tip on how hospitality can be more profitable? What are yeah, our options here? Well, you know, this is something I've got a number of clients that do, and, and um, you get mixed, always a mixed view of this. Yep. And and this is and this is not to contradict what Ivan said, but it, no. it um, it's sort of to marry up to it, but in a different way. I don't believe in just putting your prices up. Um, I do know that if you put your prices up by ten percent, you need twenty percent less people in your venue to make the same net profit, and that makes quite a bit of sense. But it's got to be marginalised. You can't just do it on every item. Yep. You've got to be looking for items that don't break certain cost barriers. But yep. one of the cleverest things I've seen in the industry, and I've had clients been doing this for a number of years, yep. is they don't see a lot of regulars on the, on the weekends. They get a lot of regulars midweek. So on a weekend when they've got capacity, you think of any other industry, be it an airline, be it you're playing golf, be it you go on a holiday, in peak periods, you pay more. Yep. And what these restaurants have done is that they will have two different menus and they're virtually the same, but they will have slightly different pricing with slightly different offerings. So they have the core protein, like it might be beef or fish, and those same elements will appear, but they might have slightly different offerings and slightly different condiments with those dishes over the weekend and they'll have a reduced menu so they can get better capacity out, they can get the meals out quicker, but they might have a slightly higher margin of 10% or 12% or 6%. But the it's, reality is it's, it's a different adding, It's a different customer. It's a different customer on the weekend and they it, have a different traditionally, expectation. And, it, and that varies from business to business. But with the business I'm talking about there, this has a huge, um, you know, it amends, it, it really amends the, the issue that people are having with the profitability because all of a sudden you're getting 6% more profitability or 12% or 10%, whatever that is on a night, which is when you're at capacity. So it has that that um, exponential impact. And I think that there's not enough restaurants doing that. And I think on a weekend, we're paying more for, you know, to have your staff there. You, you know, you're paying more to be in business. You should be charging more to be in business. Because if, if you're a bank or if you're a golf course or if you're any other industry, you'd be charging more for that privilege. Absolutely, you, you would. If you're a bank, you're going to be charging more every day according to the money market. And you're not going to tell your customers yeah. anyway. It's a surprise <laughs> yeah, right. on your statement. Ivan, yeah. last thoughts for you for profitability or on a tip because I'm writing it down. I completely agree with what Craig was saying. And I mean, the way that I view that, and if we look at even basic economic theory, right? So yep. if demand exceeds your capacity to service it, charge more. Yep. So I look at it from having higher prices on your peak periods, but then having lower prices 
through the other period times, as opposed to having a normal menu in midweek and then increasing it the other yeah. side. But one of the most important concepts, which we simply don't think about, which Craig mentioned, was speed, right? So in hospitality, we sell units of time. Yep. If it takes me 10 minutes to do it, I can do six of those an hour. Yep. If it takes six minutes to do it, I can do 10. Faster wins. So we don't think at all about the terms of how our inventory turnover mm -hmm. or our speed. And we are at heart a manufacturing facility, right? Yes. That's what a kitchen is. Yep. So our speed of production is incredibly important. Yeah. Well, that's, that's all about the workflow. You know, in, in food, when you're in the kitchen, you look at a chef and you're like, why have you got so many hand movements? It shouldn't, it shouldn't require all of those movements to put that plate out. And you save time by, you know, if you need 15 pieces of garnish, then put them all in a bowl and mix them up and put it all on together. I'm, I'm just joking for every chef out there. They're suddenly cringing on their yeah. display and, and less, using... sell more often and you make more money. That's right. Yeah. Well, we're all about making more money because that's what profitability is all about. Thank you and very that's much, what we're Ivan. There for, right? That's why we're in business. That's, <laughs> that's right. it. At the end of the day, I love what I do, but I like making money too. <laughs> Thanks very much for joining us, Ivan. Thank you very much, Craig, as well. Um, please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel where you will hear, listen, see, and watch other great interviews and get other great tips across multiple industries because we are all about SMEs in our heart. We have a big thank you to say to the SME Association of Australia for backing SME TV and podcast channel and making it possible for us to carry the message. If you have any ideas or any tips or any content you'd like to share, reach out to us, news at smea.org.au and we will get back to you and say, you're on. Thank you so much for joining us, gentlemen. We'll catch you next time. Our pleasure. Thanks. Cheers.